Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, we're ready to start the meeting. Uh, I'm Richard Romer. I'm the Prime Minister for the next couple of years. So get used to my other things. So uh, our, our stance has always been to uh, introduce any of the ministers who are attending that uh, might have something to uh, address the group with. And uh, we have two people tonight. Um, uh, uh, Dan Tischler has got to talk about uh, local forays and SoCal demos. And then we'll have Kitty uh, with the uh, Albion um, foray that's coming up in December. Uh, Dan? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, there's a uh, okay, just a couple of uh, quick items. Uh, one is that uh, for those people that have been interested in getting permits for the so called demonstration forest, that's our local forest. I've posted a link to that on our Google group and it will be up on the members area of the Facebook group. Uh, Cal Fire prefers that we don't post this out on social media or to the general public. It's something for the uh, Fungus Federation members. And that's just because they have a limited staff and they don't want to get overrun with people from all over the state. So, uh, oh, closer to the mic, you can't hear me? Hi. Well, I'm sorry, I'm just short. Anyhow, uh, so, so that, that link will be up in the members area of the Facebook page and the other as well as, not the Facebook page, sorry. It won't be in the Facebook page because that is open to the public. It'll be on the Fungus Federation page and on the Google group. And uh, one other thing I should add, anyone who does get one of those permits, please follow all the rules and remember that the parking lot in the first half mile of the road into the demo forest is private property. So, those are no picking areas. Uh, but that said, uh, this is one of the few public areas that allows us to pick. And it also is a good place later in the year for finding uh, Freighter Ellis and uh, me, Black Crumpets. And uh, uh, there are chanterelles to be found there. There's some good habitat. Often the best habitat's a bit of a hike in because along the road is a lot of redwood. But if you're going a little further, uh, get into some of the hardwood areas, you can find just about anything. And if you do apply for that permit, when you get the permit, there'll also be a species list from years and years ago. Some of those species I've never seen in the forest yet, but if we get enough rain, maybe, maybe they'll show up again. Uh, this might be the year. This might be the week that's getting it all started. <laughs> Uh, and on that note, also, it's probably about time to have a local foray. So uh, right now, tentatively, on the 30th of this month, we'll have the first local foray. It'll be very local, either at the UC campus or Marshall Fields. Uh, keep an eye out on the website, on the Facebook page, and on the Google group. I'll announce it in all three places, and uh, it'll probably be open to the first well, depending on how many co-leaders I get, the first 30 or 35 people who sign up. So. Uh, we'll mainly be looking at habitat, although I imagine a lot of the little decomposers may be coming out. It's even possible in a wetter spot to find a bolete, although uh, I think the first measurable rain we had was probably last Sunday night. So, yeah, yeah. So 13 days, we'll see what, what happens. That, that's cutting a little bit short, as dry as it's been and as stressed as the trees are. So, other than that, Phil might have something to talk about uh, for what we're doing instead of a fair. Uh, all I can say is that our alternative will probably be more outdoor oriented. So, so Phil Carpenter. Okay, disappointing as it is, we're not gonna have another formal fungus fair. 
So, uh, this year, yet again, uh, several things, uh, COVID still hanging around, uh, but mainly uh, because of COVID, the London Nelson Center is restricting us dramatically on the number of people we can have in there at any one time. And so for the amount of effort and money that goes into getting that venue, getting it set up, uh, it's just not gonna be fiscally possible. Um, and so we're, we're just going to scrap it again this year, but unlike last year where things were really tight, um, we're going to do an outreach program to, we're, we're trying to actually set up something to work with the museum. Marissa back there and I are, are, are talking about ongoing things. Um, but we're going to do some uh, the, the weekends that would normally be right around the fair, which I think is the first full weekend, the 8th and 9th or 7th and 8th, whatever it is. And then the following week, uh, we're going to do a Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon walks open to the public. It'll be a like a $5 per person, $10 for the family sort of thing, because we're going to do um, not only the walk, we're gonna include some ID work, we're going to include some nibbles. So Bob will be there you know, with some food, you know, and, and maybe we cook up what we find. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're also thinking about some other things. We're just in the process of starting this whole the planning thing, but uh, at least we're going to try to get our face in front of the, the people again. And this is not restricted to uh, the Fungus Federation only, it's gonna be open to the public. So uh, we'll be starting to put teeth into that here in the next month or so. Any questions? Good. <laughs> So yeah, we're um, starting up again. Uh, so we have our first formal long distance foray up in Albion, up in Mendocino. And the good news is right now they've had at least one inch of rain. They've had a couple of days of rain. They expect after today, two more inches of rain. And there is more rain in the forecast. So our first formal Albion one is gonna be December 3rd through uh, December 3rd through 5th, um, the website is open and is, is taking reservations. Um, it's gonna be first come, at, uh, first come, first serve, and you, you get to choose which what place you wanna stay. And then um, other than that, um, cross our fingers, it should, it should be fun, it should be fun. Um, I've also uh, talked to um, the Albion, uh, facility and we've got our uh, Albion 2 scheduled for January. I believe it's uh, January 20th, 21st. Um, yeah, 21st to 23rd. And we've also booked uh, the next year's season Albions as well. So, so, so far we should be good. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys all. Let's hope more rain. <laughs> oh, uh, not the demo, but the Jackson demonstration for, uh, Demo Forests, um, both on Google Groups, I've posted the, the PDF link so you can um, print out the permit and it's mail-in only. Yeah. Application, permit, application, whatever. Uh, it's mail-in mail -in only, the office is closed. So don't expect to be able to run up there and go to the office and do it the same day. You have to mail it in. And when you mail it in, a self-address self stamp envelope. If you don't have that, they won't process it, okay? Um, also on the Albion, uh, Albion one page, um, the link is also there too. So you can do multiple places to get the link. So plan it now, because it, it's mail. $20 for the year. So yeah, 12 yeah, months. 12 months. Yeah, the same season. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, I think that that's all the, the business that we have. So I'll bring up um, Peter, who, who is our programs director, to introduce our speaker tonight. Peter, I just like to mention the holiday Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So I thought we And we'll have that posted on the website at some point. Yeah. Just a heads up. Just a heads up. Okay. Good. Okay, Peter. It's all here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm the program minister uh, of this club, which means that I am accountable for bringing interesting speakers to this program. Uh, I happen to know nearly nobody interesting other than Todd. <laughs> for reals, I didn't. Uh, but I took this on because there was an opportunity for me to contribute to this community, and that's what I'm here for. So what I ask is that all of you brainstorm with me. If you know someone that would be a great speaker here or you know, know someone that you would like to see here, please let me know. And you know, I reach out to them and uh, make the connections and make an invitation to them, right? So the club has a small budget to accommodate guests, uh, most, mostly to offset their travels and you know, very you know, minor expenses. So, uh, but it is possible. So thank you for that. Uh, the Natural History Museum here asked that I um, uh, uh, let you guys know that their gift shop is open and please be generous if you see something that you like. And they do also have a, uh, a membership program. They've been really great uh, sharing the space with us. Um, so now I want to bring up Todd. Todd no, needs uh, no introduction. Uh, many of you. No, Todd. Uh, when I, you know, when I when I first know that this is going to be the evening where we and this, uh, you know, this drought of uh, in-person meeting, uh, I can't think of anybody better than Todd uh, to bring here. Um, so, CEO of Kingla Mushroom, he supplies many restaurants and Whole Foods and uh, other uh, grocers of uh, wild and exotic mushrooms, and he also does forays guys trips and i mean clearly there's plenty of mushrooms to be had out there so i i can't wait to hear what he had to share about tonight uh so he is actually going to talk about his family and his uh, long history of, of um, mushroom foreign here in california and what's it like being an italian family foreign for uh Puccini's. so uh without further ado todd please come on in. Um, I don't know if I need this or not. But yeah, I think we're just going to move it out of the way. Maybe not. That way? Oh, that's better. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty good at projecting my voice, and I just, the feedback gets my way. But I, I first off, I want to just thank uh, everyone for coming tonight. Uh, it says a lot, um, you know, challenging going through the rain and and the storm tonight for all of you guys to be here. It's really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful and taken back by everyone's presence. And um, just so excited to be here tonight. This is the first meeting uh, that I hear in 19 months uh, plus maybe. And um, so it's really neat to be here in person. I'm so happy that I'm vaccinated and being able to hug people that I haven't hugged and kissed in a long time. And it's nice to have that little touch of normalcy coming back into our lives. Um, so yeah, my name is Todd uh, Marcelini Spanier, and uh, today we're going to talk about Fungagnolo. So this is a, a project that I've been working, I've, I've had King of Mushrooms for 25 years. Um, I started off, uh, my mom here, Jan Spanier, uh, she 
went to a restaurant in Burlingame called Echo, which in Italian means this is it. Here it is. And uh, the chef there was, uh, and I became really good friends with him actually uh, since he uh, sold the restaurant. We've been hanging out uh, for the last 19 months, pretty heavily drinking some great wines together. Um, but uh, Turaj uh, Sharif is his name, he's Persian. And um, he's like a, a, a second father to me. He's an amazing man. And I had been picking, I, I was playing basketball and I had injured myself and I couldn't play basketball that winter. And so I, well, screw it. I'm just going to go out and mushroom hunts. <laughs> like, Every day after school was mushroom hunting, and there were so many chanterelles in the inside the fridge and inside dried in the pantry and, and in the freezer. And my mom was like, enough, you know. So they went, her and my dad uh, the, went to this restaurant, Echo, and uh, they said, hey, you know, our son picks a lot of chanterelles. Would you be interested in taking some off of our hands? And um, so, oh, yeah, of course. I just want to come here. So he, I, my mom drove me, I didn't even drive. My mom drove me down there and I had this huge box, must have been 20, 30 pounds. And I bring him in the back of the restaurant and he, he uh, goes, oh, what do you have here? It's a chanterelle? I'm like, yeah. So, okay. Goes in the registry, pulls out a hundred dollar bill. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teenager, you know, hundred dollars. That's like a million dollars, you know? So I bring it back to my mom and, uh, and I'm like, mom, check it out, you know. And I said, okay, well, how are we going to go down to Wells Fargo? We're breaking $5 bills. And that's your lunch money for the next month or so. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Um, and I grew up with um, my grandfather, Ed Marcellini, here, uh, taking me out when I was five years old around Lake Merced, uh, picking mushrooms. We, we, I, one of the first mushrooms I learned before Porcini Porcino, one porcino, do we porcini? Um, you're gonna learn a little Italian tonight. <laughs> um, was uh, agaricus lilacep, the cypress agaricus. And there's a lot of cypress that grow up on the uh, San Francisco coastline there around Ocean Beach and what have you. And so, uh, yeah, we would go out and call them pinkies because when you cut them, they turn pink. And so we would go out and pick pinkies. And I just became obsessed with mushroom hunting and every time that it rained i would ask him grandpa let's go mushroom hunting no no it's not the moon's not right no it didn't rain enough no it's too dry you know there was there was always an excuse i but i just wanted to go you know so uh we had he kind of built up this game when i was a little boy whoever found the most mushrooms or the biggest mushroom was the rebe fungi and you didn't have to cook or wash dishes, you just sat there like a king and, and, and got served, you know? <laughs> and so that's the genesis of King of Mushrooms, the name of my company came from is, is that childhood memory. And so when I first came out uh, with the, my business card, I gave it to my grandfather, and, oh my God, huge laugh, you know? I'm the king, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and he had lost his finger, you can't see it there, but um, right before World War II, he worked in a, machine shop and he used to do all the straps uh that went around the golden gate bridge those those where the where the smaller cable comes down that holds the big cable so he was making those and the owner son of the machine shop pushed him too hard to to put the the, the wax bar on the on the grinder and it, and it pulled his finger off so my grandfather when he'd get upset with you he'd give you that nub you know you know <laughs> <laughs> he was really a character and that's his brother Silvio Marcellini and I was really blessed growing up as a child because my grandfather was one of five brothers he was the youngest of five and my mom's mother's family uh, she was the second youngest of nine so I had all this extended great uncles and great aunts that were you know like amazing mentors and and I was really blessed to be um, kind of grow up very Eurocentric and just have all these old ways. My, my great grandmother was the last um, family to have a cow in San Francisco. And she'd make her all her own butter and all her own cheese and everything from the, the cow. And what was the name of that cow, mom? Do you remember? 
Really? <laughs> I'll see the cow, the last cow in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, I'm really blessed. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, Fungagnolo, what, what is Fungagnolo, and uh, the history, the heritage, the lore, uh, and the food of the Italian Americans. So let's, let's get into it here. Um, so this is my dad. My dad is in the other room. Oh, there's Papa Tim. Hi, Papa. There's my dad, uh, and he's uh, in the Chantrell patch. And uh, Papa's a Fungagnolo, but uh, Papa got into mushroom hunting uh, really through uh, his father later on in life and really through me kind of pushing my dad. Well, hey, Grandpa's like, I can take you. Why don't you and I go, <laughs> you know? And so we uh, really got into Chantrell hunting. So a lot of you guys know Pizzagnolo, right? Uh, a pizza maker. But it really, in Italian, it translates to the pizza master, the, the, having a mastery of the culinary arts of making pizza. And that's kind of what a fungagnolo is. So fungagnolo, um, it, it's an Italian word. So it's a person who sells wild mushrooms and forages wild mushrooms. But they're, they have a, a, a deep understanding of the forest and when and where to go for mushrooms. And that, so a fungagnolo can be anyone who, who has that knowledge base. And uh, this is a great photo of this uh, uh, year up in uh, the, I got a, just a small little taste. Some people in the room here got a little bit more of a taste. I, I had 30 minutes of, of ecstasy at 11,000 feet up in, um, in Utah this year. Um, and so this is just kind of the code of conduct. You know, there's, there's kind of a code of conduct amongst uh, foragers or game hunters or fishermen, um, you know, there's my, my grandfather, my dad's father, Joe Spanier, I also got into mushrooms. So he taught me five different kinds of mushrooms and then Ed taught me five. And Joe would always say, there's old mushroom foragers, there's bold mushroom foragers, but there's no old bold mushroom foragers because they're all dead. And I, I you know, I've always taken heed to that. Um, I know all of us get really excited and we think like we know chanterelles, oh, that's a beginner's mushroom. And we get overconfident and, and that overconfidence can really get you into trouble. Um, one instance, we were up in Anderson Valley and we were picking uh, Matsutake and, and we went through and we found Amanita um, smithii growing right next to the Matsutake. And I did a whole talk about how to tell the difference and key it out. And then I said, okay, now we're going to throw all these Amanita smithii away and we're going to start chopping up the Matsutake. And luckily I was going through each one and I was chopping. I'm like, oh, well, that's an Amanita smithii. So we almost, you know, poisoned ourselves. So, you know, what I learned in 1996 when um, Sebastiani um, family, they all went out Italian Americans. My grandfather was kind of part of that whole scene of picking coconut, overly Amanita caltrata, and with now with social media, people are so bold and and will post up Amanita caltrata all the time and go, you know, I'm pretty sure this is this. I'm going to eat this tonight, and I just I used to like comment, and then I got kind of scolded back. So now I don't even comment. I just I just hope that people don't hurt themselves, but. Uh, that's what happened with the Sebastianis. They were out picking uh, Amanita caltrata, coccoli or ovoli mushrooms, this very prized Italian mushroom. And the family brought them back. And what, what do Italian Americans do as, as fungagnolos? They tend to drink some grappa when they're out picking mushrooms. Grappa is a, an Italian liqueur and it's cold in the morning. So my grandfather would always, you know, espresso con grappa, you want a coffee with some grappa? topping or some brandy over the top, you know, uh, so we'll warm you up and you're a little, you know, you're tipsy out in the woods. And then you come back and you get all your mushrooms, pick your basket. And what do you do? You pop a bottle of wine, you know, and you start drinking wine and chopping up the mushrooms and you're never really sober. And then serious. So this is how you can really make a mistake. And I really believe that that's what happened with the Sebastiani family. They all ate death cap. And, you know, unfortunately, the senior passed away in 96. 
And there's been a lot of poisonings over the year, but a lot of times when you see it with the, the Italian American um, culture, it's usually with uh, Amanita Caltrata over, hopefully they make that mistake. Um, respecting mushrooms, respecting the wilderness, packing out all the trash, including the dog poo bags. I mean, how many of you guys have seen those damn dog poo bags on the trail that someone's supposed to come back and pick up, but they never do? I mean, it's just like, oh, you know. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if those are mushroom hunters with their mushroom dogs or just whatever, but it's it's really uh, disappointing to see that. And, and uh, confidentiality about patches and, and never sharing your GPS coordinates. I, I can't tell you how many people in the early days of social media that I saw post their GPS coordinates and then got upset at everyone for going to the spot and pissing off the landlord that gave him permission, but didn't give the whole world permission. Um, so yeah, you know, be smart about once you put something on social media, it's there forever. And if you have a small little patch that isn't big enough for many people, um, it'll be gone for forever because everyone and their brother will be on top of that patch. So be, be secretive, be confidential or quiet about um, your, your patches. Um, Leave the forest in the forest. So if you look at these mushrooms, they're all clean and beautiful. That's because when we forage for mushrooms, my grandfather always taught me, hey, don't pick a bunch of dirty mushrooms and throw, you know, have some respect for what you're doing and brush everything off, cut the dirty ends off, put them in there clean. So when we get back, we don't have all this work to be sitting in the kitchen cleaning mushrooms for hours. I'd rather just be able to chop and cook. And, and so... Leave, leave the forest in the forest is one of the codes of conduct of the Kungagnola. Always have permission on private lands. Um, I, you know, I'm guilty. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm guilty. <laughs> but you should try to be respectful of, of that, especially in some areas where uh, when you get up into Mendocino County, um, you know, the, the Emerald Triangle is starting to calm down um, now that marijuana is legalized. But nonetheless, there's some, you know, people I've gotten into some areas where there's cartel present, you know, and they got these big garbage bags full of pot plants at the base of all these trees, all these seedlings in there. And, you know, and those guys are desperate and desperate people do desperate things. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's best to, you know, try to stay in public. And you can still run into stuff like that, even in national and state forests. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, at least if you're on state lands or, or, or national forests, you've got a permit and the rangers know where you're at. You kind of told them where you're at. And it, it's a little bit safer, a lot safer, I would say. Um, show respect to other foragers, other, uh, others in the forest and forest rangers. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people just get so protective and aggressive in the forest, like it's their like, like it's their land, it's our land, you know, it's like, uh, and if a ranger comes up, you know, uh, it's better to be upfront and nice and cordial than be aggressive. And, um, you know, we're all of us in, in all the different mycological societies and lovers of foraging and, and the outdoors are losing less and less of our um, areas that we can go pick and forage in. Um, because of unfortunate interactions with bad behavior out there. So I think it's always good to be kind to others. Uh, and yeah, get a, get a permit before you forage, especially BLM, uh, national forest and state forest. Always go to a ranger station and find out what's going on in the area, where they allow foraging, where they don't. And that way you don't have to worry about getting busted. Um, this is my buddy, Chef Neil. And uh, who said that mushroom hunting isn't a contact sport? <laughs> um, yeah, he had his glasses on his head and he hit a tree and the, the part of his glass went, and went right into his head and caused that cut there to happen. So you got to be cautious uh, when you're in the woods. Um, so here's a black bear print. And this was uh, morel hunting up in the Sierras. Um, several years ago, about three, four years ago. 
Um, I have, I've run into bears a few times, but I'm pretty big guys. So they, they pretty much run away. Um, but, uh, I have had a mountain lion stalk me and try to get above me, keep trying to get above me to get on top of me. And I will say, you know, when you've got, here's a mountain lion right here. Look at that. Um, so, you know, when you're crouched down, you're in the perfect position for them to get you by the neck. Um, I have one story that I'll share with you that um, I have an avid uh, Fungagnolo that comes and brings us tons of porcinis every year. And him and his brother were out um, in the oak forest here on the other side of the hill in Santa Clara County. And there was like open space grassland and this mountain lion was, you know, here to the front entrance and it had its tail like this, you know, and it was just slowly getting closer and he had a stick and he, he, you know, started yelling at it, but it kept coming closer and closer. So he grabbed this huge log and he kind of put it up in front of him and the cat ran up and he, luckily his brother was up behind him up on the hill and he yelled for his brother. The brother came and yelled at him, uh, at the cat. And then the cat kind of just sat down like 30 feet away and just sat there, just waiting for them to make the wrong move. So, uh, so they, they backed up, you know, got their chanterelles and backed up. And he's like, I'm, I'm done with picking chanterelles. I'm going to pick porcinis from here on out. <laughs> um, but yeah, you got to be cautious of mother nature out there. So um, equipment, you always need a Gandalf style walking stick, right? Um, and we use a walk. If you guys come mushroom hunting with me up in Mount Shasta, it's a big deal up there because the duff layer is like four inches, five inches, sometimes in some places, 12 inches. So you can't see the porcinis. They're completely covered in pine needles. So the only way you're going to get them is with that Gandalf stick, you know, and probing and poking around. Um, a wicker basket, right? Uh, what, I, what I cringe when I see is plastic bags. Plastic bags are like shake and bake chicken, you know? And that's what happens to your chanterelles, especially if you're not leaving the forest in the forest, right? All that dirt just gets all, and then you get there and you unload them out of the bag and it just, so you always want to uh, try to use a, a, you know, wicker basket or a plastic bucket or something that's, that will hold the mushrooms and not uh, protect them. So it's our army knife, it's like MacGyver. Uh, GPS is always good. So you can find that exact location from the previous year. You know, you gotta, uh, be able to, uh, you know, there's some years where I know a patch the size of this table. And if you can't find that exact patch in the woods, you won't, you won't be able to find it. You won't be able to come back there. So some of the GPS is really good. So you can get right into that area and then get underneath the duck and, and find it. And then I have some friends that have trained dogs and if you're able to train a dog, wow, that's amazing. Um, so this is a picture of my wife, Christina, uh, when we did our Italian tour in Italy and there's a, a little mushroom basket of love. And this was at the Santa Cruz Fungus Festival. This is a giant uh, fire fungus, um, a, a giant polypore mushroom. And, uh, and I used to have all the kids put it up to their ear and say, this is my ear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what started the uh, mushroom hunters in Italy? And this, this is a really interesting story here. Um, what happened was, is that, you know, all the immigrants came to California because of the gold rush. And the, this professor here, uh, Alessandro, uh, who's with the Florence uh, University of Florence? Um, just in 2003, he was at this general's house and found a golden nugget stamped U.S. California 1953 on it. So they just made the discovery that the, and this is going to have some precedence later in the lecture, um, that basically California. And the gold rush and all the Italians that were here helped support um, Italy coming together. Italy was just a bunch of kingdoms. And so all these people came from different kingdoms. But um, 
they, you need money to have a, a revolution. And, and the gold and the money came from California, uh, ironically, and they just found out about that. So Giuseppe Garibaldi is, is the man who's credited with, with uh, Italy unifying as one country. Uh, so the whole peninsula became unified along the Sicily. Um, and there's another gold rush. And I always was wondering, and I just did the research recently, um, you know, what brought all the Italians to north, north? You know, I know why the Italians went for the primary gold rush in the Sierras and why there's all these old school Italian wineries and still Italians up there who pick mushrooms. Um, and but I didn't know about the 1851, which is now called Wairika. There, there was all these nuggets uh, found up there. And so that started the secondary uh, gold rush, kind of a, an unknown, not, not really publicized gold rush of Northern California, Siskiyou County, Shasta Trinity. Um, and now we're gonna talk about the Italian strike of 1909. So, this is how all those Italians got up there. Is they went up there for the gold and didn't find their gold and then ended up taking a job at McLeod. And um, McLeod had, McLeod is a really interesting town. I've been going to McLeod since I've been, oh, I think about seven, eight years old. So my grandfather every year, um, I don't know how he did it with my mom, but he, he said, okay, it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take my grandson for um, a week before and a week after. <laughs> so we go for two weeks trout fishing and mushroom hunting all over um, Northern California. And so McLeod is interesting because it's one of the few areas, mountain areas that has this really diverse cosmopolitan feel to it. You have uh, so many different ethnicities. You have Italians, you have Japanese, you have Chinese, you have um, African Americans, you have um, a Modoc, and you can go to an old saloon uh, up in you know downtown Mount Shasta and sit there and see these old timers. And one's a chief Modoc guy, and then there's a, an African dude that you know, uh, African American dude hanging out, and some old Italian guy, and they're all hanging out, chumming together. They grew up together because of the McLeod Lumber Company. They brought all these workers in from all over. And so all these different ethnicities ended up growing up together. And so there's been several generations now. Um, McLeod had, um, I think, like in 1909, it was like 1,200 Italian-American laborers, which was two-thirds of the labor force for the lumber company. Um, and when the strike hit, if you look down here, you can see it uh, was May 26th. May 26th is usually the peak of Porcini season yeah. in, in, in McLeod. So no wonder they were striking. They're like, we don't want to work anymore. We're going to pick mushrooms. <laughs> but um, what was happening was is the um, Canadian lumber industry drove the price down of the, the lumber and everyone who lived in McLeod was had their housing and food and everything was all taken care of by the company. And they were making, I want to say 63 cents uh, a week. Um, and then all of a sudden the Canadian market brought the price of, of lumber down. And so for them to compete, they brought it down to 32 cents. Well, a lot of Italians at that time when they were coming over were part of, um, you know, uh, all kinds of different political groups, and anarchist, anarchists was one of them, and so they got together and they pulled the strike, and the uh, U.S. Army came to McLeod, and it was a big deal. And they had guns, and I mean, this could have turned ugly really fast if it wasn't for the uh, the general um, Italian. Um, uh, Councilier at the time who mediated, drove all the way up there and mediated, the, spoke Italian obviously, and mediated between the U.S. Army and the Italians. And it all kind of calmed down, uh, but it was definitely climactic. The Italians were like, hey, 
we want to sell our houses if we can't make 64, 63 cents a week, and now you're only giving us 30, 32 cents a week, well, we're going to sell our house and we're going to move to San Francisco. They're like, no, you're not going to, the lumber company's like, no, you're not going to sell your house. We own your house. So that was the big, uh, you know, scramble there. So here's a, a legendary, we're going to, so Fungagnolo is one mushroom hunter. Fungagnoli is two mushroom hunters. So from here on out, we're going to start talking about all these legendary Fungagnoli. And I've been really blessed to um, be able to meet all these people. And they're not necessarily Italian-Americans, but um, we'll definitely have quite a few Italian-Americans we'll talk about it. Sandro, Alex, um, I went to school with his son and we had um, botany class together and then we had study classes and we kind of hit it off. And then he was, oh, my dad's a mushroom hunter too. I'm like, no way. And, and so we uh, stayed friends all these years. And um, I went by his house and he showed me this picture of this ginormous porcino that he found. And this was probably back in the 70s uh, when he found that 70s or early 80s. Yeah. But um, great guy, great guy. And here were some morels and porcini that I had gifted him when I went to go by to visit him. He had, unfortunately just lost his wife, uh, Diana, she just passed away recently, but um, great, great couple, great people. And um, this is Marcelo. Um, and Marcelo uh, had a wonderful Italian restaurant in San Francisco. He unfortunately just, uh, divested out of it. Um, but I would bump into Marcello in the woods quite a bit. And um, all these old school Italian guys are just super red hot passionate about mushroom honey. And um, I would be up in the, you know, up in Mount Shasta, way deep in the woods. And all of a sudden I'd hear, you know, someone yelling out, Marcello, Marcello. You know, I look up, you know, there's Marcello with the big porcino in his hands, you know. Um, but really great guy, great restaurant, old school Italian in San Francisco and Paravel, and uh, just a, a really nice man. Uh, it's still there, but he's no longer the owner. Yeah, he's no longer, he stepped down uh, from it. Um, this is my good friend in the back hiding. He's quite shy, um, Vincenzo Cucco. Vincenzo is from um, Castelbono in Sicily. And Vincenzo has been trying to get me to Sicily ever since I met him about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, he's a great, great man with a huge heart. I invite all of you guys to go uh, visit him at Pavinos in Belmont. And, um, and this is his good buddy, Diego. And Diego is, uh, every time I've gone mushroom hunting, he is the Rey de Fungo. He finds the most mushrooms. The first one of the day, the last one of the day, the biggest mushroom of the day. This guy is like, he, you know, if you take him into the area, he will find them. Yeah, Diego is incredible. Um, and see, that's Diego. That's Diego right there. He got the big one. He's the Red de Fungi. This is, this is no Photoshop. This is real. That's Vincenzo at the Vinos. And Vincenzo and I, we went up. He had a special pass to get on private property up north on the coast. So we didn't get haggled or have any problems. And so we were able to drive right into the patch. And he had never worked with these are lychee case baskets. They're what all the whole commercial mushroom industry uses. And we can stack them up on our backs and we can pack out, you know, up to 80 pounds to 100 pounds on our back. And so we use those, and I like the green ones because you can, no one knows when you're picking the mushrooms. But um, Vincenzo is super excited, and we, we had to take pictures because if you, if you tell someone, oh, yeah, we picked 200 pounds, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you probably pick like 20 or like 20 mushrooms or something. So that's why we took the photo just to say that this is the real deal, and you can see all the, the porcini and so he took, we shared, we split it down the middle 50-50. He took half, I took half because we, we picked together. That's usually how we work it when we go mushroom hunting. So we share everything. And he made the most amazing filling that he had at the restaurant for months and months and months. He roasted all those mushrooms down and with 
caramelized onions and, and ricotta cheese and, and made a beautiful uh, raviolo, handmade raviolo. Oh, oh. Yeah. How come the ones in the back are targeted? So these are all number ones. That's a great question. These are all number one porcini. And then as you go back, they're getting bigger and bigger and more and more mature. For Italians, we love them all. We don't care how mature they are. Even if they have a few bugs in them, we don't care. Protein, no, no problem. Uh, there's no extra charge for the protein. When they're big like that, we like to take them and we'll slice them and dry them. And if they have, you know, not a, a grotesque amount, but a few holes in them, that, that just all that better soaks up the, the, uh, the flour, egg, and breadcrumb. And we do porcini fritti. And porcini, it's like a big Milanese cutlet. And you put it, my family in Italy, they do chestnut flour, they do egg, and then they do 50% uh, plain breadcrumb and 50% Parmigiano Reggiano. And then you take an uh, olive oil and you swirl a garlic around the olive oil. When it starts to sizzle and get brown, you pull the clove out and then you put your cutlets down, golden brown, golden brown. And you make your risotto with all these number ones. You saute it and fold it into the risotto. You start with your risotto with the dry porcinis. They, they can be ugly. It doesn't matter because you're just making the broth, the brodo. You can soak it in chicken stock or just in water. And then you ladle that into your risotto. And then all those porcini fritti go around the risotto bowl. And you eat it like a piece of bread. So you take that risotto, put it on the... So good. Um, this, these are my mentors. And um, uh, this is Bill and Louise Freeman. And I have a great story to share with you. I don't know if my mom's going to be happy about this story, but uh, I'm going to share it. Um, so Bill and Louise wrote this wonderful book, Wild About Mushrooms. And um, Bill is influenced my life in so many ways. Uh, you know, he was the, the, the head and founder of the Peninsula chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, he was the head of uh, toxicology um, for uh, the San Francisco Mycological Society. Uh, he was a doctor at Kaiser. Um, Louis, Louis was amazing. She was an artist and my grandmother and her totally got along. And she was just a, a really amazing woman. And she, every time I bring them morels, she would make me these grilled cheese morel sandwiches that were just, I mean, you thought the risotto was good. I don't know, <laughs> it was neck and neck, you know. Her, her grilled cheese with morels is pretty amazing. Um, but what happened with uh, Bill is that Bill uh, was um, good friends and one of his patients was one of the founders of the San Francisco Mycological Society, um, Salvatore Belecci. And Salvatore Belecci was my mom's professor at Balboa. Uh, he was the music instructor there. And um, Belecci used to come around the neighborhood in the Excelsior, where my grandfather grew up and where I partially was raised part of my life, and knock on doors. And you know those little Danish tins? You know, you ever get the little Danish tins with the cookies inside and they got the, the chunks of sugar crystals in the top? He would pack those with mushroom compost and then fruit a bunch of cremini mushrooms or butt mushrooms out of them and then knock on people's doors and try to sell little tins. Uh, you know, see if you wanted to buy a little tin of mushrooms that were growing out of the Danish tin. And so my grandfather knew Salvatore Belecci. And um, later I learned that Salvatore Belecci um, had gotten um, stomach cancer. And, and Bill said, hey, that is due to the agaritin. You're eating too much raw mushrooms. You need to slow down on eating raw button mushrooms. Agaritin now is a known carcinogen. Um, so yeah, any of, uh, any of you, if you remember anything about tonight, don't eat raw button mushrooms, <laughs> cook them. It tastes better. <laughs> but, uh, so Bill, uh, the story that I want to share with you about Bill was, you know, he was a mentor to me and I was always picking mushrooms that I wasn't sure about. And then I'd bring them over to Bill's and then he would ID them for me as I was learning other varieties. And in the spring, I was picking, uh, the spring Amanita. And I thought I had a good handle on it. And I picked a bunch and I put it in the fridge in a Tupperware container. And I put, you know, do not eat 
Well, my dad comes in and my dad goes, oh, nice looking mushrooms. Hey, Jan, you want a, a omelet? Oh, yeah, that sounds great, Tim. So he, my dad gets in there. And we always, I grew up having chanterelle omelets and all kinds of mushroom omelets on Sundays, a big deal. And so we would have an omelet on Sunday. Well, I wasn't around. I was playing basketball or something. And I get back and, and I go in the fridge. Where's the, where's the mushrooms? Well, what happened? I, I wasn't really confident about my ID on this. We were confident about your ID. What, what do you put in the fridge for? You know? And I'm like, well, I just, I put a thing, don't eat. You know, and your mom and I just got done eating most of those. And I'm like, you're kidding. And she heard us in the other room. She's like, Tim, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know. And so uh, you better go up to see Bill right now and make sure that those things aren't going to kill me and you. And so my dad drove me up, and I go up to Bill's door, and I knock on the door. Hey, you know, uh, Bill, how are you? Can you ID these for us? <laughs> oh, you know, these are these are spring amanitas. <laughs> Never eat these, you know. <laughs> They're okay, but I would never eat them. You can easily make a mistake, you know. I think my poor mom, she got sick just thinking that she might be poisoned, but she got sick just from the stress of it all. But uh yeah, Bill and Luis were wonderful people, and uh, I'm gonna miss them dearly. Um this is Joe Bergeron, Judge Joe, mushroom man. And he's an amazing Fungagnolo. He loves morels. His first morel that he ever found was at Bill Moise's house up in Pinecrest. And he's walking around all day. He can't find morels. And everyone said, well, put the morel goggles on, right? He still can't figure it out. So Bill and Moise go up above right by their house and they clear all the pine needles away. And they leave this one solitary morel they go, okay, Judge Joe, okay, come over here. Look in this area here. Do you see it? You see, I don't, oh, <laughs> you know, and finally, finally he finds morels. Well, now Mushroom Man is, uh, is quite a good morel hunter. And this was at the uh, railroad fire, uh, and, and we did tremendous up there. And, and everyone went home with a box of, of morels, and he had stockpile. Another great story about Joe and the connection with Bill. Any of you guys have been driving up 280 or 101 and you see the 380 and all of a sudden the 380 just stops, but there's like an underpass underneath that's not developed. Well, that was a road that was supposed to go right up over uh, San Francisco uh, watershed department and drop down on highway one uh, to bypass Sharps Park. Well, Bill with the Sierra Club, got together with Judge Joe, who was a real judge, and um, they fought against um, the state and the county in doing so, and they won. And that's why if you go to this day, uh, you'll see 380 just kind of ends, and there's this underpass that it just cuts off. <laughs> that's because uh, Joe did the right thing and saved some beautiful wild areas. Mm -hmm. The most interesting man in the world. Everyone knows this guy, right? He's actually a Fungagnolo. Yeah, he's a Fungagnolo. Here he is. Reno Taini. He's the most interesting man in the world. Um, Reno truly is the most interesting man in the world. Um, Reno uh, was a safari guide. There's pictures of him. I tried to get a hold of him and get the pictures for tonight, but it, I wasn't able to get through them. But next time you see this Fungagnolo presentation, Trust me, I'll have the photos. Um, but he's with the whole Zulu tribe. And he's like, you know, the most interesting man in the world, just sitting there with his little beard, you know. Um, he also was um, uh, part of bringing um, outdoor education to fruition. So I, all of you guys that grew up in California that did outdoor education, well, he's the godfather of outdoor education. He's the first, he started the wilderness school. And... Um, the wilderness schools still run up in San Francisco. He's just kind of consults now. He's not involved, but um, Reno is just, uh, he's the most interesting man in the world, can I say? And he's a Fungagnol. <laughs> he makes his own grappa, grappa di luna. And, uh, <laughs> and here's Reno and Paolo, and, and Mario, Mario di Paolo. Mario is from the same 
uh, village as Vincenzo, Castelbuono in the province of Palermo in Sicily. Uh, Reno is from um, right above Genoa, between Genoa uh, going into the Po River Valley. There's a kind of a, a little offshoot of the Apennini and, and that's where his, his family is from. And uh, yeah, this was us doing some mushroom hunting up on the North Coast. And this is at Sole Restaurante on 37th and San Mateo. Uh, so this is Mario's restaurant. And um, they, they like porcinis. And you can see how big uh, porcini get. I mean, they, they really get big. Here's Reno again. And um, Siphon was uh, really an amazing man. Another connection and what makes Reno the most interesting man in the world was he was also involved with all of the Laotians um, and Cambodians and Vietnamese who, who uh, were coming across um, the Mekong and, and getting killed by the Vietnam um, War and trying to, to get into, into Thailand. And so he did a lot of work in Thailand. If you look closely there, there's a little elephant that's a little Thai elephant around his neck. And so... I would say probably about 70% of all the immigrants from Southeast Asia that came here after uh, the Vietnam War, um, Reno helped um, in some way. So Reno's got a really big heart. And so I, he didn't know Siphon, but I knew Siphon. And he was like, I want to meet this guy. You know, we, we might have some connection. Well, Siphon was a uh, general in the, and he was just a, the kid, he was a teenager at the time, but he was a general uh, in the Lao um, uh, military, which was a kind of this underground war that no one talks about that was part of the Vietnam War. But there was, you know, the people of Lao helped the Americans out big time. And so um, he, he came here in a political asylum. And that story kind of leads into um, something beautiful that David Aurora has really been a proponent of is bringing to light all these fungagnoli, all these mushroom foragers, hunters, um, and their life stories. And, you know, those people that came here, um, whether years ago from Italy and Asia, or, you know, and, and more recently from Asia, you know, they had a tough time assimilating into, you know, everyday American culture. And where they found themselves was in the forest. That's where they found peace. And and Siphon, uh, I should have brought some tonight, I apologize. He was one of the few to have a permit with the National Forest Service to go and harvest uh, California sagebrush and uh, incense cedar. And so when you go to any of those little, um, you know, kind of crystal stores or they've got the incense and they got those little bundles, more than likely it came from this guy. Yeah, him and his wife and his son would go there and spend hours and hours in the, in, this, in the back here behind him, behind Reno's, where they would dry it all out. They would, you know, dry it all out and then bundle it all up with uh, the cotton thread. Um, uh, unfortunately, Siphon just passed away this last year and I'm going to really miss him. Um, but he was really a wonderful man and an amazing fungagnola. This guy, you know, he would call me, Stop. the mushrooms are on, you got to come up here. So I drive all the way to Mount Shasta and he would take me out and he, he taught me so much about, you know, not just being about the, the pine trees, but also about um, the manzanita and the other types of smaller bushes that also harbor porcinis. And we were out one time, I remember, and there was all these other foragers, commercial, you know, all picking all around us. And they were finding just like, they only had one or two mushrooms. <laughs> we picked all the way around him and we picked like two buckets full. I mean, he really, really understood where and when and why, you know, uh, the mushrooms were growing. He was a really big heart. I remember one time uh, he showed me a picture of himself. I'll have to get it in my next presentation. And he's all dressed in uniform. Every year he was invited to Washington, D.C. Um, uh, to pay tribute to him and all of the Laotian soldiers that helped to save thousands of lives uh, during the Vietnam War. So really, uh, really cool people. I'm, I'm really blessed to 
have known some of these people. This is my buddy Lucas and uh, my good friend uh, Rudy, Chef Rudy Retivio. And then, um, that bear print that you saw earlier on, that was the same day. Um, Lucas is like a, a legendary Fungagnolo. This guy, he has a tattoo of, of the Matsutake symbol in Japanese on his, on his arm. I mean, that's, he's very committed. <laughs> he's very committed. Um, and he's the gentleman that's been forging these amazing chanterelles that you guys see here today. Uh, um, he's been bringing down literally like uh, a half ton to a quarter ton uh, a week uh, from the Olympic coast right now. It's an amazing mushroom season up there. You guys get a chance to get up there. There are literally chanterelles all over the place up there. And they, they grow under the, the fir and the Sitka spruce. And so they, they are super clean because it's all mossy. Unlike our chanterelles here that, you know, we've got the oak and we've got a lot of dirt and stuff. And so they're really dirty. Um, and you got to wash them and really clean them out. These are just, they just grow up almost pristinely. Uh, this is Chantrella Spokum. Yeah. 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 They're really bright and beautiful. Yeah. And uh, uh, Rudy Rutilio is uh, from Liverno. And so he grew up on the coast, but like all Italian, uh, just love being out in the woods and love foraging. And last year, um, I was doing, a, you know, Forage SF um, every weekend um, up in Mendocino. And we'd have small groups come up. I'm going to do it again in November every weekend. And Reno would come up. I mean, uh, Rudy would come up pretty much every weekend, him and one of his buddies, and just bring this big spread of focaccia bread and cold cuts and a couple of bottles of wine. And, you know, there's nothing beats going mushroom hunting and then, um, just having a big picnic out in the woods. It's really special. But yeah, two great, great fungagnolos. This is Andro Garo. And uh, we're at the railroad fire, you can see here, May 29, 2019. And um, Angelo, maybe if you guys have read Michael Pollan's book, um, Omnivore's Dilemma, he's the pig hunter in Omnivore's Dilemma. And Angelo's a really great guy. He's from uh, 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 Sicily, uh, from the southeast side, uh, Cusco, I think it is, if I'm pronouncing it right. And uh, just, uh, you know, a Renaissance man. He, he makes wine. He makes his own salami. You know, uh, he makes his own pasta. Um, he started his own company called Omnivore after Michael Pollan, after the book. And he, make, he does all these specialty salts. And I helped him get started. He does a, a porcini salt that's really nice. And let's take my jacket off here. He's got a puff ball in his hands there and then some beautiful uh, burn morels. And I was just with Angelo just this last week and we're in the Carneros picking uh, grapes, uh, picking pinot, and had a wonderful time. And uh, he's uh, just a, a really... Uh, Great guy. So this is a little video. I don't know if we can play it or not. Maybe we can't. Oh no, there we go. It's fine. Is the volume? <laughs> so Strada di Porcini, the, the street of Porcini's. So that's sometimes how it goes, you know. And this is my buddy, uh, Joe Marini. Joe is with us on that. And uh, he's, we're, we're flipping off. It turns out that he knows uh, Ryan Bonagard at Bonagard Winery. And he's like, dude, you know Ryan? I'm like, yeah, I know Ryan. He goes, let's take a picture and flip him off. Yeah. So, uh, but all you guys probably know Joe, if you've been to Santa Cruz on the boardwalk, he's the candy man. And um, I met Joe through Angelo, and uh, Joe is really a great guy, loves, loves to go hunting, he's a big duck hunter, and um, just a, a great all-around fungagnolo, you know. This is Willie Neva. Willie is from the same area as my grandfather's family in Italy, and um, Willie is... 
I've never met anyone like Willie. Willie knew all of my great, uh, he knew my grandfather and all my grandfather's brothers because Willie used to work at the flower market and my grandfather was a florist for 85 years, Marceline Brothers. And so Willie uh, worked at the flower market as well. So he knew all my great uncles and my grandfather and um, just, just a great guy. I've spent a lot of time uh, hanging out with him and he'll come by and buy mushrooms. And this last year, during uh, the beginning of the pandemic, we had one of the best porcini seasons in the spring that we've seen probably in 10 years. And he couldn't, you know, because of everything going on, he couldn't come by the warehouse. And he's, I, I want to say he's 98 or 99. I mean, he's up there. He got so frustrated. He goes, you know what? If I can't go and get porcini, I'm going to hire some guy and have him drive me up to Mount Shasta. I'm going to go get the mushrooms. <laughs> and he did. At 98 years old, he had had someone chauffeur him and drive him five hours all the way to Mount Shasta. And he spent two days up there picking mushrooms and then drove five hours back at, at 98. That's a fungagnolo. <laughs> that's someone that's dedicated. But really, he's an amazing guy. This is uh, Lou Maravilla. And Angelo, uh, Lou or Luigi is a, a really good friend of mine and he has been picking mushrooms forever. We spent um, a, a lot of time, you know, since my grandfather passed, I've kind of adopted these guys as my adopted grandfathers, you know. So Reno, Luigi, you know, these are all my grandpas now. And, and so I'll, I'll call up Lou and say, hey, Lou, let's go mushroom hunting. And, and he'll, he'll, he'll go. He's 89. He'll go. And, he'll, you know, he won't go crazy and go hike up, you know, deep in the woods and stuff, but he'll hang out in the car and he'll get out of the car and look around a little bit and he'll get some mushrooms. So the last time we went about two years ago, we're up on the coast on Highway 1 and we're driving by in an area you're not supposed to pick mushrooms. But he sees them out the side of his eye on, on the other side of a barbed wire fence. And I'm like, and he's like, no, no, no. We didn't get any mushrooms. That we got like two or something. It's like, you know, I just saw a bunch. Come on, Todd. Please go, go back to go get them. You know, you're a young guy. You could do it. <laughs> oh, okay. So we parked the car and I hoof it all the way back. And, and there's this big huckleberry bush. And so as the cars are coming, I hide behind the huckleberry bush. And then there's no cars. I, I, uh, I had this big jacket and I put this jacket over so I didn't get caught in the barbed wire and I just jump over the barbed wire. And I picked, I don't know, seven, eight big, beautiful porcinis and I have them in this bag and I, I go back and I put them behind the huckleberry bush and wouldn't you know, right when I'm going to jump over, a car comes and I'm a big guy so I don't want him to see me so I just, just fall to the ground and duck down and I, I think I my rib or bruise my rib. and I was in so much pain and uh, I'm like here you go Luigi I got your poor genes you know but uh you know the things you do for people you love um but yeah Lou's a great guy and we've had a lot of fun times together so now we're going to get in a little bit you know we've talked about the fungagnoli now we're going to talk about the food Italian cuisine um and this is one of my idols, and it should be your idol, too. Remember we talked early on about um, Italy uh, with Garibaldi. Um, so Italy was all separated into all these kingdoms, and then Garibaldi brought them all together. But a lot of people say that uh, Pellegrino Altuzzi brought the country together because he wrote a book. Uh, a lot of people call him the godfather of scientism. And what he did was he was a businessman, he lived in Lucca, he was a writer, and he went all over Italy, right when Italy became unified, and he met with all the nuns, he met with all the mamas, and he sat there, he took notes of all their recipes, and he compiled them into this book, and the book is right here. This is the only cookbook, the only, I have it. And you can get it too. They, they translate in English. It's, oh yeah, sure, thank you. It's the only cookbook that is still in print. Ju Julia Childs has got nothing on this guy. You know, <laughs> she's got nothing on him. He, he's still in print. 
he printed this thing back in the, you know, uh, you know, 1800s, you know, late 1800s. So yeah, just uh, an amazing book. And uh, I, I like the sound of it better than in English. You know, La Cienza in Cucina e le Arte di, di Mangiare Bene. You know, the, the science in the kitchen and the art of eating well. And it's a huge, thick book. And it's basically the invention of Italian cuisine. And him and uh, Escoffier, who was the big time, you know, everyone knows, you know, putting on the Ritz, right? That's Escoffier. Escoffier was the guy that, you know, did stuff, you know, just off the wall pairings and sauces. French cuisine is known for the chef and his techniques. Italian cuisine is known for the ingredients. It's all about the ingredient. I think that's why when you cook Italian food with mushrooms, you're really accentuating the mushroom, the ingredient. That's the focal point, right? That's the basis of Italian cuisine. When you're French cuisine, you're adding herbs and sauces and spices and, and doing crazy techniques and things that are cool and wonderful, but sometimes losing the, the origin, the, the beauty of just the ingredient itself. And, and that's why I think I love Italian cuisine so much. I, I love French too, but uh, Italian cuisine is, is what it's all about for me. And uh, this is one of my clients, Delfina, and they've been supporting me for many years. And uh, they do an amazing porcini pie when I got porcinis for them at a reasonable price. And uh, she gifted me this pie. I went in there and I brought her porcini. And uh, I was, can I take a picture of you? You're giving me, I'm going to give you a porcino. You give me a pizza. <laughs> And uh, I always think of uh, KQED. Uh oh, sorry. What did I do there? Uh oh. Come back. Here it is. There we go. Um, I always think of um, of. Uh, oh, geez, I lost my train of thought. But Delfina is a great pizzeria. And uh, KQED, thank you for bringing that back. I always think that there was a commercial. Remember, you guys remember those commercials? You know, I'm proud to be an Italian American. I'm proud to be Asian American. All those different things that were going on. And there was this thing about the Italian American. He was in he was in Luca's focaccia shop in San Francisco, and there's this huge line, which there used to be, you know, for many many years. And I'm sure the line will come back and. And he's in line in the focaccia and he buys some focaccia. And what does he do? He goes down the line and gives everyone who's waiting in line some focaccia. He rips off chunks and he's there. I love that. You know, and that's, you know, that's so Italian to like just share. And, uh, and so that's this picture. I just, I love that because it's, it's sharing and sharing is caring, right? And I don't know why we can't slide to the next one anymore. On, oh, on the keyboard. Okay, cool. So these are porcini. This is uh, an event that I did for Colavita olive oil. I don't know if you guys ever see Colavita, and uh, but they're a uh, well-known Italian olive oil company, um, and they're uh, they have a facility now here in California where they do all the bottling, and they're actually using California olive oil as well. Um, and I, I invite all of you guys, if you're going to cook with olive oil, always try to get California olive oil. Um, unfortunately, when you get oil that's imported in, um, there's a lot of blending going on and a lot of people falsify the blending and there's no olive oil police out there. So even though they're saying it's extra virgin or whatever, it may not be. But if you get California olive oil, it's more than likely 100% olive oil. Um, and uh, so here we're doing uh, porcini a grilla. Um, and it's basically what you want to do when you do a dish like this is you want to take the porcinis and you want to uh, boil them whole um, in some porcini broth. So you get some, you know, dried ground up porcini, porcini powder, what have you, because uh, porcinis like this don't have a lot of flavor. So to give them that flavor, you want to make a porcini broth or stock and you boil them in that stock. And then you pull them out, let them cool off, slice them in half. And then we got them on the grill here. 
and you guys are gonna see this beautiful uh, sear marks on the porcino there. And here's the dish that we did. We had a little uh, pesto with uh, some little cherry tomatoes. And we had a little fava bean uh, with some pea shoots and some julienne endive. And then we had uh, the porcini there with some uh, balsamic uh, caramelized red onion and uh, a little porcini reduction sauce there. And there's all the dishes. So this is a, uh, I do a lot of private catering with Chef Rudy Rizzilio that you saw earlier. And uh, this is one uh, event that I got contracted by the executive chef of uh, Colavito. And we did a private tasting in San Francisco. And uh, yeah, that's uh, Gary and Matt and myself up in San Francisco. And we had a, a wonderful day together. It was a lot of fun. Um, so this is a new project that I'm working on that I'm hoping to get into all the stores that I work with throughout the Bay Area. And uh, what it is, it's uh, a shelf talker and it's like a little recipe. And so this is gonna be, there's gonna be a barcode here. Uh, I, I should say uh, there's gonna be a QR code like this here. And then you'll be able to go to the store and you'd be like, I don't know what to do with porcini and I don't know how to do this recipe. And you just go on the barcode and it'll go right to a video of me. And I'll show you exactly how to cook that mushroom that you see in the store. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the idea. And uh, I'm excited about it. And here's, we just started doing it. And here's my first little demo of the recipe. So you guys will have this, whoever's watching Zoom or, um, geez, the poor people at home. I'm sorry, you guys, you've been looking at my chest and <laughs> I haven't been paying attention to the Zoom people. <laughs> Oh, do, I, do they see this? But they, if they're looking at me, they just see my chest. But, um, you know, this is basically what you'll, you'll get in the, in the video, give you a little breakdown of how to do the bruschetta. And um, this is a picture of my wife and I. I want to thank my wife, Christina. She's been just a jewel. I'm, I'm so blessed. Uh, we're going on. We got married in 2007, and she's been there with me every step of the way. We've been through thick and thin together. And she's a really amazing woman. Um, and we have, uh, you know, all the ingredients that you're going to need to make a bruschetta there. And then there it is. There's the finished product. Um, you know, this, these are just pictures, but it'll be a video. So you can kind of watch the video and you can just keep replaying it. And it'll be a short video too, like maybe two or three minutes. It'll be really quick. And then it gives all the description of preparation of how to, how to make the Porcini, but simply this is this is a crostini that you can do in the oven. Um, and what you do is you brush olive oil on there, and um, I prefer to use uh, avocado oil or grapeseed oil because when you're doing in the oven, you're around 350 to 400, and olive oil will burn at those temperatures. So sometimes it'll denature the olive oil, and, and it won't taste so nice. Avocado oil can get pretty high. You can get above 400 and grapeseed oil can get above 400. The best is ghee, you know, clarified butter. Clarified butter, you get like, you know, easily 450, 465, somewhere there. Um, so then you get, you know, a nice golden brown and you take a clove of garlic and you rub it around the edge of the bread. And that just adds a little aromatic garlic bite to it. And then the porcini, you just cut in half and you pan roast, uh, high temperature. Um, and once again, I like to use uh, grapeseed oil or avocado oil to do that. Get that nice sear on both sides. A little bit of shaved garlic, a little bit of parsley, salt and pepper. That's it, you know. Brusca porcini bruschetta. Perché no? <laughs> and um, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank uh, the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz and uh, the museum here for uh, having me come tonight. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so I have some chanterelles that I brought. If you guys want to buy some mushrooms, and I brought uh, these little bags here of uh, of uh, porcini. I want everyone to have an amazing Thanksgiving or Christmas, like I always grew up having. And this is the key ingredient: is the porcini. This is what makes the secret sauce from Nama. And this can be used uh, just to soak. This is a half pound bag that you can put. Put, you know, just use half of this and you put it in hot water and it makes that aroma, right? You can use the chicken stock with just some water 
and then you could be the result of instead of just adding water, you're adding the fettuccine here, right? You see that flavor. So you got you got the, the, the turkey, right? And you got your roasted turkey, you got all the drippings in the bottom, and then you soak this in the drippings, right? And then you add, add a little bit of, of water to that, and you know, uh, loosen it up, and then you know, put it through a, a sieve to separate all the all the you know bones and fat and all that kind of stuff out, and then you, you sit down and you've got this porcini turkey gravy. <laughs> you know, so that that's the, the secret weapon. If you guys decide to get one of these, um, you want to keep it in your freezer. It's got a ziplock on it, and so anytime you need any, you just grab a little handful or a couple of tablespoons out, put it back in the freezer. It's why in the freezer? In the freezer, it'll never get insects, never get pest damage, it'll never get mold. If you leave it sit out and the sunlight hits it, um, the sun will create moisture in there and will get all mold. Insects can literally bore through the plastic and get in there. Or when you open it up in the kitchen, it might be humid and humidity gets in there, reacts to mushrooms, and mushrooms can all this, uh, insects can all of a sudden just, uh, you know, appear. <laughs> So you always want to keep these guys in the freezer. So yeah, we got porcini's twenty bucks. If you guys want to, uh, it's dry porcini's. Yeah, crushed up dry porcini. It's got the pores, and the pores are the best part, you guys. I cringe when I go to restaurants and I see them cut out all the pores. <laughs> That's for me where all the flavor is is in those pores. Um, and so if you cut all that out. You really lose something. That's why I love porcini fritti because you got that big porcini and you got that thick, you know, two inches of green sponge on there. And once you get that breadcrumb on there with that cheese and it's crispy, then inside it's like green and creamy and shroomy and it's just delicious. Yeah. It's a con contrast. Now, if you take a big porcini like that and saute it with a, that big green sponge, it'll get it all mushy and slimy it's fine if you're doing a soup or if you're doing a filling like you're going to mix it with some ricotta cheese and make a filling for tortellini or ravioli but if you're just going to be um sauteing and eating it it's a little slimy yeah not so not so appetizing. yeah all right any questions yes yeah So two things going on is, is one, the porcinis that grow under the chestnut forest in Italy, they're a different animal. They're a different animal. But I would say the porcini that you guys were picking, you know, those rubiceps um, or the porcini bianco are pretty on par to Italian porcini. So the next step is making sure you got a nice solid, like a number one that's, like this is a number one, right? solid, firm, like a potato. And this is more like a number two, you know, uh, this one here where it's, it's slightly kind of whitish yellow, but not green underneath. And that that middle maturity of porcinis, those are the best for roasting. Um, and those are the best for just almost very versatile, right? The little number ones you can shave like a truffle, you know, over a hot dish or something like that or risotto or pasta, uh, but they don't have a lot of flavor, you know, the little buttons. Um, the middle size maturity level where it's kind of white to yellow or, or yellow, full yellow, those have really good flavor. Uh, when you get them, when they're green underneath, they're good for drying like this, or they're good for the porcini fritti, or just buzzing up and making a puree or filling. Um, to, yeah, but to make that, you know, partly it's 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 a species difference. Um, but yeah, that's a great. Uh, there was a restaurant in San Francisco. I don't know if any of you guys remember. It's called Zoo years ago. Loretta was the chef there. Um, there was I, there was there's so many fumagnolos that I would love to share with you guys that I know. 
I just scratched the surface. But uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again sometime and uh, talk about some more really interesting people out there. Loretta used to get porcini from uh, one of the first Italian American fumagnolos to sell mushrooms in San Francisco. And his name was Lorenzo. And Lorenzo would go in and sell porcinis on the back of his Mercedes. And then he would trade too to barter for salamis and bottles of wine. <laughs> and then he would go up on the coast and talk to these ranchers and say, hey, I got a salon, I got a bottle of wine, can I go fish? <laughs> That's how we did it. And uh, Lorenzo's still alive. His wife was instrumental in Pavarotti uh, setting up all of Pavarotti's uh, concerts here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, he uh, has one daughter, and he's pretty much, you know, just hangs out at the time of social club up in San Francisco. But getting back to Bizu and Loretta, Lorenzo would go there. And one time I was there um, with Lorenzo, and Loretta sat us down, and she cooked a porcini similar to what you're talking about with the steak. And she just took a, a porcini, like a number two, cut it in half, and then she cut some angles on it, and then she put little sprigs of thyme in there, and then she put it in a in a uh, a little steel pan, roasting pan, and then she just uh, poured some clarified butter over it, and and then just threw it in the oven, um, probably you know like 350, 400, and then when it came out, she just seasoned it with a little bit of salt, brown like pepper. And then the drizzle of the solid vinegar. And, and that's how it was served. It was just like a half of a porcino. And you just pour it at night and lodge it. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. On the back of the porcino that you said, you can do that. How long do you think they would last? Definitely. Definitely. There's, there's private parties of billionaires that, that have uh, mammoth feeding fests. You know, and they pull a mammoth out of the out of a glacier. And so <laughs> someone can eat mammoth meat from thousands of years ago. I don't see why you can't hold on some dry for cheese in the freezer for a couple of years. But hopefully you eat them before that ever happens. <laughs> Any other questions you guys? Well, thank you again. It was really a fun